could hear everything on the map. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who I don't already know, my name is Michael Sibley. I'm the communication director here at the department. Thank you for turning out this morning for this very important announcement. A couple of housekeeping details before we jump right into it. We have our interpreter here. Please, in terms of your camera shots, be mindful to keep her in your shot. It kind of defeats the purpose if the viewing public can't see what she's trying to, uh, to translate uh, through interpretive language. So please keep her in your shot. In terms of questions, once Dr. Mackey and Dr. Harris have made their presentations, there's a microphone to my left over here. The people who are watching online cannot hear you if you're not speaking into that microphone. We're going to ask that we all adhere to social distancing protocol and give each other a little breathing room, six feet space as you make your way to the mic in no particular order. Uh, in which you guys get to the microphone. Just go to the microphone to my left, give yourself the appropriate space, and ask your question. Notice I said question. One question, please. I know there's a temptation to do a follow-up. If you will ask your initial question, you'll receive an answer to that question. And if you have follow-up feedback, please circle back around to make sure that the people behind you have an opportunity to ask their questions as well, as is usually the case when we do these kinds of things. If someone has asked the question that you intended to ask. Uh, it would, in the interest of everyone's time, uh, behoove us if you either move on to another question, just not ask the same question twice. And again, if you have a follow-up question, circle back. And while you're standing in line, remember the six-foot rule. With that, we are going to get started into our presentation on the roadmap to reopening schools. We're going to start that with our state superintendent of education, Dr. Eric Mackey. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sibley, for uh, the introduction. And we appreciate the uh, media joining us today and, and making sure that citizens of Alabama have good information about what's going on as we prepare for the upcoming school year. And certainly, I know we have uh, about 1,000 people, I think, watching on live stream. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is go through pretty quickly uh, some slides that, that talk about our roadmap to return to school for the 2021 school year. Now, the roadmap itself is about 50 pages long. It's available on the department's website, uh, but it's pretty overwhelming. Let me say that. It is, it is designed for superintendents and principals and curriculum directors and people who need the technical underpinnings in order to open school this fall and to be ready for that. There is also a parent guide. And the parent guide is only a couple of pages long, and it will address the most specific and, and uh, interesting and important information for parents to know as students get ready to come back to school. So both of those will be on the website. Uh, they will be live this morning. You can go and click on the parent, parent guide, and if parents say, hey, I want more detail, they can go click on the other guide and, and, and get the more detailed um, information. The roadmap itself um, is, as I said, about 50 pages long, but I'm going to take about 10 slides and go through what's in it this morning. And so you see it um, behind me here. And on the very first slide, we want to talk about what um, governance, the governance structure, and what the roadmap is and what it's not. And I won't belabor this, but I do want to address, we, we made sure to point out there are four things that the roadmap is to cover, and there are four things that it is not. Um, so it's a guidance document, but it's not legal advice or an ALSDE mandate. It's based on expertise and experience. Uh, we've had great input from the Alabama Department of Public Health, and I'll be introducing our state health officer, Dr. Scott Harris, in just a little bit. They've been with us every step of the way and continue to be with us and will be throughout the school year. We've also partnered with a group called Opportunity Labs that helped us and several other states pull together the very best research from across the country and even from other countries as we try to navigate and figure out what's the best way to move forward uh, in the new school year. So we've also brought in experts from Alabama. About 60 people directly contributed to the big planning group and then subcommittee groups. Those included teachers and administrators, uh, technical people, private business and industry folks, lots of people pulling together to make sure we had 
the most comprehensive and competent plan for the upcoming school year. So it's also comprised of essential actions designed to spur thinking, planning, and prioritization, but it is not an exhaustive list of every action that every school system or every school leader will need to take this year. It's also part of a continuum of school decision making, not a remote learning playbook and not a school closure guidance document in its entirety. So it's there to de design to help. It is not the answer to everything. Our educational responsibilities. Uh, we wanted to lay out who is doing what as we go into this summer and the upcoming school year. So first of all, of course, the Alabama Department of Education. We have a lot of responsibility to make sure that we have uh, the right frameworks, the right responsibilities in place for our schools. And I'm going to go more into some of those in just a little bit. So we have addressed areas of health care, nursing, transportation, uh, vulnerable populations, which would include especially um, students that might have medical conditions um, and students that have special needs and others across the state. Child nutrition. You know, we've fed millions of meals uh, even during the time that school has been closed, and we'll continue to work with that into the new school year. Attendance and what attendance looks like on the physical campus and what attendance looks like in remote learning. <clears throat> and then, of course, how to spend federal and state funds. We're, we are very fortunate in this state that we are not talking about significant cutbacks. As I talk to my colleagues across the country, some are looking at budget cuts of up to 20% in the upcoming year. At a time when we really need resources, they're having to cut resources. And as everyone knows, uh, Alabama's legislature passed and our governor signed a record-setting budget of over $7 billion for K-12, pre-K, post-secondary, and higher education institutions. Uh, about 67% of that comes to our K-12 schools. And so we're fortunate that we're not looking at budget cuts, but our state has invested well for the upcoming school year. And in addition, we've distributed about $200 million to local schools or in the process of distributing that as they turn in their plans to get ESSER CARES money. I won't go into all of that. I realize it's a lot of acronyms we're talking with, but money that's come from the Congress. And there is more money that will be coming forth uh, that they will be able to use to offset some of, some of their needs for this fall. So we do that at the Department of Education. As I mentioned in a few minutes when I finish the presentation, we'll introduce Dr. Harris, our state health officer, and the Department of Public Health they have responsibility for contact tracing. So that's, there have been a lot of questions this week about contact tracing from our superintendents, and that really is a Department of Public Health issue, and, and I'm going to let him address that, and there may be some questions about that today. Um, it's public health's responsibility to provide the guidance and, and the official public health orders. So we follow those. We read those. We want to make sure that we apply them to school. And, and I, I've got to say, Dr. Harris and his team have been wonderful about consulting with us as they go through the process. And when they would write a new paragraph, say, how would this be interpreted in the schools? What can we do to maybe make it more clear for you? But at the same time, that really, that responsibility for public health does rely with that department. And then, of course, also uh, the recommendations for um, physical distancing, for personal social responsibility and for our collective social responsibility and how we, how we protect ourselves and how we protect one another. Uh, like everybody in this room that I see is wearing a mask, except for myself, which I had on until I came to the microphone. So that's one of the things that public health has told us is a good way to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. And then, lastly, our local school systems. So they may be last, but they are not least, because as I've said many times, we don't actually teach children here at the Department of Education. Now, I consider myself still a teacher. I still hold a teaching certificate, and when people ask me what I do, I, I always respond first, I'm a teacher. And then they usually ask a follow-up question, well, what do you teach? And eventually I have to give it up what I really do for a living. But in my heart, I still see myself as a teacher. But we have thousands of teachers who will be returning to classrooms with children to take care of those children's physical, emotional, and educational needs this fall. And there is nothing more important, nothing more important in this process than a teacher working with children, either in a classroom or in a remote situation. That teacher is responsible. And so we want to make sure that we support 
our local school districts, obviously our superintendents and school administrators, those curriculum folks, those school nurses, the cafeteria staff, the custodial staff that are keeping our schools clean, they're all extremely important. And all of us, from the state superintendent to the custodial staff to the assistant principals, all of us are about supporting our teachers because they are the most important link in everything we do. So you see that, that it will certainly continue to be the responsibility of local school systems to manage the day-to-day -day responsibilities of their schools. Now we're going to go to the next slide, and this is probably the one everybody's interested in. So what will uh, school look like in the fall? Will our campuses reopen for in-person instruction? Well, absolutely, our campuses will reopen for in-person instruction. It is our intention that all of our campuses will be open for in-person instruction, uh, that there will be an opportunity for in-person in the classroom instruction for every child in the state that, who, that, whose parent chooses to send them to school all year long. Now, we, don't, we cannot predict the year. That was also my intention at the beginning of last school year, but some things interrupted that. So we're going to talk a little more about what could happen during the year, but that is our expectation that we would be physically open and would remain open all year long. But there will be remote learning options. So we've been polling around the state. We've asked local superintendents to poll. And about 15% of parents tell us that they are not comfortable sending their children back to school, that they want a remote learning option. In many cases, it's because their children have severe underlying medical conditions or someone else in the family does, and they're afraid for their child to go out and then bring something back. And we understand that. And so we've been working very hard since March to make sure that we're going to be in the place to offer as many remote learning options, uh, as high quality remote learning options as possible in the fall. But <clears throat> those local boards of education, you see the third point, working with the recommendation, under the recommendation of their superintendents and in consultation with the Department of Public Health and other health officials, will make a decision about campus status throughout the school year. So we could be in a situation where we say some students have to go home. Again, Dr. Harris can, can address the contact tracing and, and what we have to do to make sure we keep the population safe. We could get in a situation where a whole classroom has to be closed for a number of days. So those kinds of things may have to happen, and those calls would be made by the local Board of Education, again, with the recommendation of the superintendent, and in consultation with the Department of Public Health. And, of course, that always is subject to change. As we did this year, as you know, the governor um, had to declare a statewide state of emergency and closed all the schools at one time. And certainly she retains that authority if we get in a situation where that needs to happen. <clears throat> the roadmap focus areas. So as you go through the roadmap, there are three distinct sections. We focused on wellness, so things around like school nursing and how do we take care of our, our children. Operations and facilities, cleaning, getting students to and from school, child nutrition, those sort of things. And then instruction and technology, which we've put together because technology has become such an important and integrally linked part of instruction in this modern age, really, but especially in the last few weeks. Our roadmap recommendations <clears throat> are divided into three sections. There are essential recommendations, and those are the ones that are either required by law, by policy, by a governmental order, or they're a critical practice that we believe is absolutely essential to the reopening of school. And then there are guidance recommendations. And the guidance recommendations are, of course, very important, but they are not one of those that's, that's essential that be provided by law or a critical practice. And then there are other considerations, and there are many other considerations out there. Every school is going to look different. Every school already looks different around the state. What we do in one rural community cannot be the same as the way we react in one of our major cities. And even rural community to rural community, what we do in Greene County will not look like what we do in DeKalb County. It's going to be different based on the setup of that school, based on the resources, based on community needs, and, of course, based on the spread of the virus. <clears throat> Navigating the, st the uh, status of campus availability. So you'll see two sections 
Then there are do now things. And we shared these earlier this week with superintendents, things that need to be done between now and the start of school in August. And then there are return to campus things. So things that when students begin to return to campus in a physical way need to be done uh, during that time. And again, you'll, say, you'll see in the do now, <clears throat> there will be essential and guidance and consideration recommendations. And in the return to campus, there will be essential guidance and consideration um, recommendations. And then instructional scenarios. This is one we've had a lot of questions about. So what will it look like? Well, there will be traditional school, which will look a lot like traditional schools always look, but it'll look somewhat different too. Our students should expect that things are not gonna be completely back to normal. We're gonna be doing enhanced cleaning protocols. In some campuses, eating lunch will look different. Eating breakfast will look different. The school day may look different, but it'll be a fairly <clears throat> traditional, normal looking circumstance. And then as I mentioned before, we have parents who said they want their student to learn from home. And so we'll have a remote learning option. <clears throat> we have used uh, money that was given to the Department of Education, about $18 million was allocated to our department to spend to support students during the coronavirus pandemic. And we have chosen to spend the vast majority of that to buy remote learning curriculum, very good, well vetted curriculum that'll be available to every school in the state. Pre-K, we went all the way down to pre-K through 12th grade. We've been doing remote learning in this state for a long time. In fact, through our very successful and award-winning access program, we started one of the first remote learning uh, platforms in the country. We've got a lot of experience with that. But it's just nine through 12 and some eighth grade courses. So now what we're having to do is expand on the knowledge base we have all the way down to pre-K. Now, as an educator, I can tell you, and as a parent, it is much different to put a 16-year-old on remote learning than a six-year-old. And we understand that. That's why we've gone out and made sure we get the very best resources for our teachers. In March and April, we did some remote learning, and we did some really good things around the state. I saw some amazing things that, I, I'll be honest, I didn't think we could pull off all the things that our teachers and curriculum directors and our staff here at the department were able to pull off back in the spring. They did amazing work. If you go today to our Amstai website, which you can get to through our State Department website or go straight to the Amstai site, and you'll see lessons and videos and resources for math and science standards across the curriculum. And those were, were gathered that was conceived and gathered and, and uh, pulled together by our staff here at the department, working with volunteers all across the state. It's an amazing resource. And we'll continue to have those kind of resources and we'll continue to develop more of those kind of resources. But we had teachers who were also having to go out and they were having to pull from here and pull from there and do this and do that and try to get together remote lessons. So what we've done now is we have bought in a package high quality remote lessons that the teachers can deliver without having to do hours and hours and hours of research at night. It's still gonna be delivered by the local teacher. Those students will still be enrolled in their local school, but they'll be learning in a different way. And the third piece on this slide is blended. So what's blended mean? Well, it means you're doing a little bit of both of the above. So as Dr. Harris will be talking to us um, about about contact tracing, we know that there, there are gonna be times this year when student has to go home. They have a positive test, they have to go home. Now, there are gonna be scenarios that we can't predict. And so they're gonna go from the traditional setting to the remote setting, and then they're gonna go back to traditional again. And so that's what blended is. How do we make sure that we, we transition students in and out of schools? And that's gonna be difficult. And there's nobody who should who should enter this school year thinking, oh, it's going to be easy. This is indeed going to be the most difficult school year that we have ever faced. It's going to be the most difficult school year to get through. But we absolutely are determined to do it. And we're determined to do it not because it's easy. We're determined to do it because we have students who are counting on us. 
And so we have to do it, and we will. And then there's one more slide. We save the very best for last. So what are we doing to make things better? Well, as I mentioned, remote learning is going to be the key to all of this. Because even though some students are choosing to, to do remote learning, and it changes from county to county. I told you statewide it's about 15%. In some communities, it's only about 3% of our, of our parents say that their children are going to choose remote learning. But in some counties, it's actually 80%. In some places where there's more severe outbreaks, people are saying we're going to keep our students at home. And so if they do, we've got to have good resources for them. So what we have, again, invested in is statewide digital curriculum. Our, our superintendents have been using their funds, their um, what we call advancement in technology or A&T funds provided by the Alabama legislature. They've been using those funds to buy devices, to buy mobile hotspots. They've been getting private grants to buy devices, to buy mobile hotspots, and many of them already had things. We are working on a plan now to put more Wi-Fi on our school buses because that's, that we found that was a very successful way in communities that just don't have Internet access to get some points of Internet available. So we're going to continue to look at resources to make that happen. We're going to provide high-quality professional development for our teachers in how to deliver remote instruction, and how to drive learning in the 21st century. We've purchased already a statewide learning management system. It's very technical. Everybody outside the education world won't care that much about it. But the LMS is kind of like the iCloud works on your phone. That's where things are stored. And that it's not itself a curriculum. It's not itself a delivery mechanism. But it is kind of that basket that holds all the teachers' lessons, all the students' tests, and all the correspondence back and forth. Some of our school districts had amazing LMS systems. Some of them had zero, and zero money to buy. So we've used some of our money to buy the best available for every school system in the state. And then connectivity in rural areas and broadband access points, Wi-Fi access points, and hotspots. As I mentioned, partnering with our local communities, we've continued to roll out more and more ways to get people Internet at home or Internet hotspots in the community. It will not be a perfect system. In a perfect world, we would have a high-speed Internet connection, connection to every child's home every minute of the day. It's very important. I mentioned I was with superintendents earlier this week. We spent a lot of time going through these points. And one of the superintendents, uh, Dr. Matt Aiken, who's superintendent in Gulf Shores and who is the president of that association said if you don't believe internet's important turn your cell phone on to airport mode airplane mode and carry it around for a week and see if it affects the way you work and learn and that is unfortunately the situation that a lot of our students are dealing with so we've got to do more and more to get them access at home and we're doing that many people know most of you in the room know the governor yesterday rolled out a, a task force under um, ADECA Commissioner Kenneth Boswell to work on how we're going to get more high-speed internet across the state. And in the meantime, we're working on things like making these school buses, mobile hotspots, getting Wi-Fi to, uh, we've already worked with the legislature to get Wi-Fi to every public library. So there are access points all across the state at different places. So that goes through our roadmap. Uh, I won't bore you and go into the, the details again, but it's available on our website. I'm going to introduce Dr. Scott Harris, our state health officer, uh, for a, to see if he has a few comments. I know he's mostly here for questions. As Dr. Sibley has said, he's going to ask that anybody who has questions for us would come over here to this microphone. But first, Dr. Harris, if you'd uh, give us a few comments, anything you'd like to say, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Um, Thank you all for letting me join you today. I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, we have uh, worked in public health very closely with the Department of Education and Dr. Mackey's team uh, over the past several months. I, I have to say we really have grown to appreciate uh, the job that Dr. Mackey's doing. Not that I didn't know that before, but we are really seeing firsthand uh, the work that he's doing and his team is doing, and, and we have really been privileged to work with them. appreciate it very much. And 
they, they've done a tremendous job in putting together this uh, program. Uh, we were, uh, have done our, our best to give them the very best public health information we can and input in, uh, into that. Um, I, as Dr. Mackey said, it, it's really challenging to think about uh, coming up with a, a hard and fast rules for every possible scenario. I, I think none of us are even sure uh, what uh, uh, it will look like next week in Alabama in some sense. And so it, it's, it's been very difficult to think about how things are going to look a month in the future or two or three months in the future. So we know that there are going to be many things that are unanticipated. Uh, and yet, I think this is a terrific framework uh, for helping uh, local officials make decisions uh, about how to do the best things in their community to make sure that kids do receive the education that they need and deserve, but also uh, to keep people safe. Uh, and, and both of those have been our goals uh, throughout this whole process. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I know that we get asked a lot about uh, really specific guidance because people uh, take some comfort in having hard and fast black and white rules about when I can and can't do something. We all uh, like that guidance. Uh, it gives us uh, some degree of assurance. And yet, I want to encourage people to, to think beyond that uh, and think about things in, in a less binary way, in, in a more general way. As, and this applies not only to schools, but really to, to every other part of what people are doing every day. As we think about activities that, that people are going to do, um, there really are several considerations, and, and they're relative in a way. They're, they're not necessarily absolute in all cases. So um, obviously, smaller groups are going to be better than larger groups. And, and when there are ways to try to, to uh, achieve that, then obviously that's what we would encourage. Uh, people that are spread further apart, particularly more than six feet apart, are going to be better than situations where, where uh, children or anyone else can't be kept six feet apart. Um, gatherings that are outdoors are going to be better than gatherings that are indoors, uh, or at least depending on uh, ventilation, for example. Um, areas that are congested because you have uh, maybe choke points of when people are lining up to file into a facility or go through a single doorway, those are not as preferable as, as uh, environments where you can avoid that kind of congestion when people are getting together. You know, longer duration events are probably not going to be as safe as shorter duration events. So there, there's all kinds of uh, considerations that we would encourage people to think through. Um, every single situation is going to be a little bit different. Um, every bit of risk is going to be a little bit different. And, and I think the document that we, that we have here and the guidance we have here um, encourages people to think in that way and, and to realize that you can make individualized decisions um, pretty easily if you just keep these, these overall tenants uh, in mind. I wanted to say uh, something just for a minute about contact tracing. We get um, asked that question a lot. I know that um, Dr. Mackey has received a lot of questions on that, and, and I just want to um, reemphasize the role of public health uh, in contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing is a process that public health has done uh, almost forever. Uh, it, it is a major tool of uh, public health for containing any type of outbreak or uh, epidemic or, or any infectious uh, disease. Uh, we have used contact tracing uh, for tuberculosis and for syphilis and other sexually transmitted infections and, and many other types of things. And, and contact tracing is a fundamental function uh, of public health. Uh, we have continued to do contact tracing through the coronavirus epidemic. And as we look towards the fall with schools reopening, uh, that uh, function remains unchanged. We'll, we will continue to do contact tracing. Uh, and we have, uh, as you may have heard us speak about this before, we've engaged uh, a lot of other resources uh, to help us do that. Um, we, we are certainly tracing uh, at numbers that we have never had to try to do before. Uh, it's posed quite a challenge for Alabama and for every other state. But, but I say this to say that this is not uh, something that falls on schools or school officials or, or local officials to do. Um, I, I think we, certainly as we anticipate that there will very likely will, almost certainly will be cases that occur in schools. Uh, contact tracing is not um, a function for school officials to, to have to worry about. That's something that falls to public health and is part of what we do uh, every day. What contact tracing is, uh, for those of you who don't know, is that we uh, investigate a case when we learn of a positive case, or that is someone who's infected, and we find out who could be a high-risk exposure to that case. Um, in many cases, that means who has been uh, within six feet for 15 minutes or more uh, of this uh, person that is known to be infected. And then we reach out to those people to make sure that they understand that they could be exposed and give them recommendations and advice on, on how to proceed next. So that's a basic function of public health, and that will continue uh, as, uh, as it always has. 
So uh, that's really all the prepared remarks that I had to make, but I'll certainly be happy to take questions at the appropriate time. This question is for Dr. Mackey. Is there a specific date for local school districts to have their plans together so parents know if they're sending their kids back to a traditional school or doing the online learning? Uh, there's not a specific date. So the only date we have put out there is we encouraged <clears throat> school districts to consider starting a little later. Uh, many of them have moved their start, back, start date back to later in August. But we actually have schools. I think the first one in the state starts around August 4th. But there's not a specific day by which they have to have some plan like published. Yes. Look into the camera. I've got it. We'll look into the cameras when we answer. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Mackey, uh, do you sort of see this as a harbinger or the beginning of the end of brick and mortar schools uh, because of this pandemic? I, actually, I think it's the exact opposite because what we see is that uh, parents have really missed school and children have really missed school and they want to get back to normal school. Now, I, I think we're certainly in an era where we're going to see more and more distance learning opportunities in the future. And we're going to continue to have um, to be able to explore opportunities because of the power of the Internet. So an example would be uh, that students are going to get used to this kind of learning. And then they're going to find out that they can take an engineering course uh, that's not offered at their rural high school, but they can take that course online. And they've not done that previously because they didn't know what online learning was and they might have been a little bit afraid of it. Now they're going to say, well, that's not so bad. I can take that course. But as far as day to day, being at school, being a part of a school community, what we're hearing overwhelmingly from students and parents is they want to be back at school. Um, I had a question about equity and making sure that equity is maintained across all school boards in the state. I'm wondering if how, how do you plan on addressing to make sure everyone is receiving the same level of education, that it's maintained over if we see a second wave and cases start seem to be worse in the state? And I wondered if you could also address specifically the cases of special needs children and children with disabilities. How do you plan to make sure that they are getting the same quality of education as everyone else? Sure. So equity questions in Alabama are not new. <clears throat> we have been dealing for decades uh, with inequitable opportunity because of inequitable resources across the state. So there's some communities that are uh, 20 miles from a grocery store, they're maybe 40 miles from a hospital, and the schools that they get have the same, same issues because it's hard to recruit teachers there, it's hard to get resources into some of those schools. And then we have other schools that have hospitals close, uh, grocery stores down the road, and they have lots more opportunities. So equity is something we've been dealing with forever. Uh, we will continue to deal with that throughout this coming year, and we'll continue to deal with it after the coronavirus is gone, trying to close in equity gaps and make sure that we have uh, equal opportunities or equitable opportunities for everyone across the state. I've said before, to have equal outcomes, you have to have inequitable inputs. So we have to do more for some students in order to get equal outcomes on the, out, on the back end, and we'll continue to do that. I was also a part of that question about what will we do for students who are in vulnerable populations and have special needs. Uh, children with special needs uh, who are identified with special needs have what we call an IEP or an Individualized Education Program, and we call them that because they're individualized. And there's no one way to say uh, in the state we're going to treat every child who has dyslexia exactly the same way as every other child. We're going to treat every child who has um, a uh, health a, particular health issue as the same way we treat every other child that has a health issue because that individualized plan has to drive the decisions that are made for that child. Now that being said, we've had some, uh, some issues uh, during this time because of things like social distancing. So if a person needs to have physical therapy, how do you provide that physical therapy in, a, in a, an environment where you have to have social condition, uh, 
social distancing. And, of course, Dr. Harris could explain better than I. The medical community has come through valiantly with us on that. We took a few weeks. We weren't sure exactly how to do that. But now most of those questions have been answered and through the use of appropriate PPE and, and uh, the right kinds of strategies, they can return to doing physical therapy and occupational therapy and those kind of things. So fortunately, we've had a little bit of time to think through some of those and to get better answers. This question is for Dr. Mackey. Dr. Mackey, I know we've had numerous discussions about, you know, the intention to restart extracurricular activities, you know, band, chorus, sports. What will those be looking like for this fall? I know we said every situation is going to be different, but how will those extracurricular activities be looking this fall? Excellent. So we will have extracurricular activities and co-curricular activities on campus. They will look different. Uh, and we're still working through some of those. And again, it may change from community to community. So for instance, I'm going to, I'm going to pick some out. Uh, choir. I've had a lot of conversations with music teachers, what choir will look like. There are many activities where you can social distance. Choir is not one that works well with that because you need to have those voices close together, mixing together. There are many activities you can do with a mask on. Choir is not one of them that you can do well. So those choir teachers are working through thinking, how are we going to continue to have choral programs? How are we going to make this work? And, and they've got some great ideas, some ideas that I could not come up with, but that's why you have great music teachers doing that. But it's not going to look the same way it looked last year. Um, competitions, though, I know that's part of that question. People want to know, well, what about competition? We have two schools coming together, and they're playing volleyball. They're at a cross-country meet on a Saturday morning. Or, as everybody wants to know, what about football? And those activities are going to look different, too, but they will resume. Uh, there are sp specific things we're going to do. So, for instance, in football, I'm going to uh, defer some of these exacts, but the Al Alabama High School Athletic Association has been working very closely with us. The executive director, Steve Savarese, and I talk multiple times a week about um, things he's hearing from other states, things I'm hearing from other states, things we're getting from Dr. Harris and his team, and things that he's getting from his medical advisory board. Uh, some members of which are also on the SEC Medical Advisory Board and, and work with our major universities in the state. And so they are working through safer protocols. So, for instance, equipment, the balls and the, 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 that they work with and other things, those are going to be cleaned as often as practical and possible. Uh, some, there were early on some suggestions to clean the ball between every child touching it. Well, anybody who's played volleyball knows you can't do that and still play volleyball. But can you use a clean ball um, every time there's a, there's a stop in the game? So probably you can do that. There are ways to, to make it safer and cleaner than what we have done before. Can you social distance or physical distance the crowd? Um, yes, there are ways we can do that. We saw that at graduations where families sat together, but they were six feet away from the next family. All across the state we saw that. So there are ways we can make our gyms and stadiums safer for competition. Uh, they're, they're going to change some other rules to allow um, players that are on the sideline to social distance better and to be over there. So, so I, I think this is not a secret, but, uh, but one of the things we're talking about is that uh, the player's box in football is from the 30-yard line to the 30-yard line. If you can extend that, down to the 20 or the 10, then people can be more spread apart. You can also limit. I've been to many football games, and every time I go, I'm, I'm, I appreciate it very much. They always ask me, as state superintendent, if I want to stand on the sideline. Well, if I go to a game this year, I'm not going to stand on the sideline. We also don't, we don't need the local mayor on the sideline. We don't need the county commissioners on the sideline. We don't need state legislators on the sideline. If you're not coaching, we need, we need to be distancing. And so there are ways we can reduce the congestion by re reducing how many people are out there. And I think that's, that goes back to what Dr. Harris was saying earlier. There are ways to continue the normal routines of our lives, but they're going to look different than they've looked in the past as we do things to, to keep ourselves and one another safer. If I could just uh, add on to that, I, I appreciate those comments very much. Dr. Mackey is exactly right about that. Things are going to look different. Um, I, I think it's uh, really important for people to 
manage expectations about the fact that we will see outbreaks associated with these events. I, I think that's likely to happen. I think that's got to be a consideration as uh, local officials make decisions about when to resume and, and how to resume. Um, I think it's quite likely that, that we will see that at some point. And so doing everything possible we can to limit uh, the contact that people have within what's reasonable to do, you know, clearly, um, as Dr. Mackey said, uh, it's not possible to have athletics and not have any uh, contact between people in, in most cases. But, but we really need uh, people and encourage people to think through these things as carefully as possible uh, to make sure that we minimize the risk of transmission of disease to, to every extent we can. And, and we'll also, um, I'm going to piggyback off of what Dr. Harris said too, so, <clears throat> and just remembering this, so local jurisdiction rules will also apply. And we say that, you know, in our essential guidance, that it's, a, uh, it's law, it's policy, or it's a local ordinance or a critical, um, a critical practice. So we have about a half dozen cities. He and I were talking before about a few more cities are considering passing ordinances for, for facial coverings. And so if they pass an ordinance and they say if you have a, a volleyball game in our town, everybody's going to wear a facial covering. And obviously we've got to think about how that applies to students. It's not always practical. And, and I've talked to many mayors, and I know they're working through those issues. But if they say folks in this stadium have to have them on, then those rules apply in those jurisdictions. And we've talked to superintendents about that. And, of course, right now it looks different as you travel from one jurisdiction to another because different uh, communities have different rules. But we will, um, we certainly will abide by the rules that are established by those local town councils and mayors and, and others that have um, have the authority to do so. Um, my question is about. I'm really short. Here. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, about assessments and when we think about report cards and attendance and accountability, how are we going to track that for each school district? Yeah. So the question, if everybody could not hear, uh, is about accountability, assessment, report cards, and those kind of things, and how those will, will happen from school district to school district. So first of all, assessment is something we are working on. We will begin formative assessments, and that's assessments that we use to determine where a student is, uh, what their academic level may be, and what, what resources they may ne need immediately when school resumes in the fall. Uh, we do have the opportunity to do some of our formative assessments remotely because they're all online. Uh, well, they're not all online, I shouldn't say that, but mostly they're online. And so we're working through that process now. If a student can't come into the building, how do we, we make sure that we can do that assessment? Those assessments are the most important things we do. The, to me, they're much more important than the end of the year summative test because the formative ones tell us where a child is and what the teacher can do to help the child improve their, uh, their outcomes, their level. So we need to give those in the fall and we will. Um, assessment, toward the end of the year, we will wait and see what that looks like. Of course, the, the state, um, the formal state standardized test that's given at the end of most school years was not given this year because uh, President Trump and then Secretary of Education DeVos said that we should um, forego those assessments. I, and every state had the opportunity to do that, and I think every state chose to do that. Uh, many people know, because they've seen it on the news, that um, Georgia, our sister state to the east, has already said that they intend to not give standardized tests for this upcoming school year. And they are negotiating with uh, the federal government about that. Um, I've spoken to the officials in Georgia. We are certainly following uh, their, their, their story and seeing what's going on there. That would be a decision that would have to come before um, our state school board. Unless we, again, got, got a mandate from Washington over testing like we did this past year. Um, so I don't know. We're going we're gonna to have to see how that goes. And then she mentioned about report cards. Well, the report card, the, the state report card this year will be, it'll mirror last year's report card because we did not do standardized testing. Obviously, if the federal government or if states um, don't do testing next year, then, then that'll there'll be something we'll have to deal with next year. But we'll just have to follow that story as it breaks. I do not know um, what the federal government's going to do on that. But again, the, I know the negotiations are going on, and I know Georgia has already um, said that they are going to, to work with the feds on a waiver.
This is a question for Dr. Harris. Um, you had mentioned uh, just a few moments ago there will likely be some cases uh, at schools this year. How would you describe your overall comfort level with this plan? Are you extremely comfortable, or are you, do you have some private reservations about moving forward? I think it's a very good plan, and yet at the same time, I think we're all aware that we continue to have cases uh, around the state. Um, there's increased risk as we increase our activity, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, I think that's self-evident, and yet uh, we understand uh, the importance of trying to return to some kind of normal activity, uh, not only in, in the educational world, but in other parts of life. So. It's a, it's a challenge to balance those. Um, I think that um, no one really knows exactly what the right answer is. I think we're trying to make the best decisions we can uh, with the data that we have at the moment. Um, if you look um, around the country, there's, um, I, I should say, 51 different plans, but really there's a lot more than that uh, because all of us are trying to make the best decisions for our own, uh, for our own states and our own cities. Um, Again, I think we can predict that we will continue to see a disease as we have more people out and about, and we need to do everything possible to uh, to try to limit that. Um, you know, the decisions that we make every day um, are what is going to determine how this turns out uh, for Alabama and, and for the country. And it's not as simple as just saying one time, well, I'm going to uh, social distance. It's actually a decision that you have to make all day long in every uh, situation you're in. You have to think about what choice do you make when you walk out your door in the morning, and what do you do when you go to the store, and what do you do uh, when there's a group of people that you want to socialize with. These are decisions that every person has to make several times a day, every day, and we're going to be making those decisions for months to come. Dr. Harris, uh, we heard you speak earlier about uh, outbreaks linked to extracurricular activities. Um, when, when those, for those students that will be back in class, should their parents expect or anticipate that there will be individual cases and outbreaks in the building? And what will be the protocol for notifying parents if there's a case or outbreak in, in their school? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I'm certainly not trying to pick on the school system in terms of uh, predicting there are going to be outbreaks. I think we're, we're continuing to see outbreaks uh, all over the state in many different, uh, many different settings. Uh, but, but the way we uh, handle that in public health is the same way that we have handled that all along. We investigate that case, uh, determine uh, if someone is infected, and then we do everything we can to determine uh, if there are close contacts to that person that need uh, further follow-up. And, and so that will uh, continue uh, with schools just like we have done all along for everyone else. Questions for Dr. Mackey. Dr. Mackey, I know you had said that you know um, this roadmap is not the you know the answer to everything. It's just just a, you know it's guidance and recommendations. What does the road ahead before school starts look like for our local boards of education across our state? What does their road ahead look like sure. following the unveiling of this roadmap? So as we we roll the roadmap out, uh, of course we have shared a draft that actually looked very similar, obviously, to the one we have with superintendents this week and worked multiple days on that. Uh, my, the reason for rolling it out to superintendents before everyone else saw it and their teams, their leadership teams, their curriculum folks was to get input. And so we've made some significant changes. Uh, Dr. Harris and his team have also been very helpful throughout the spring, but even this past week, trying to, to update and make changes to make things more clear. So the, the path forward as we plan for the upcoming school year then now for the local school systems is to develop those on the ground responses, their plan for what that will look like. Uh, as a for instance, remote learning. I mentioned that in some communities about 3% of parents tell us they're going to choose remote learning from day one, whether, they're a positive, whether they have a positive case or, in, or a quarantine or some situation in their family or not. Other communities, it's 80%. So that obviously is a difference in the number of teachers that you're going to need to, to do the remote learning versus not do it. We are encouraging them to go ahead and, and be thinking about how many teachers need the professional development in how to push out that curriculum, how to deliver those lessons remotely, um, and then 
that you can always overtrain, always have more teachers and train than, than you think you might need. And then some of them are actually recruiting retirees to come back uh, who may not want to be back in the school based on their age or, or condition, but they, they're willing to teach the remote lessons. So can we get more people to come in and to help? Uh, they're buying equipment. Uh, there are, there's still equipment available. Many of the things that we need are, are back ordered because we've ordered them weeks ago, but should be in by the time uh, school starts. So they're doing those kinds of things. And then uh, I can't um, emphasize enough the cleaning. So they're doing a lot of, they have been doing a lot of cleaning and getting ready, but, but you can only clean a building so many times when nobody's in it or relatively few people are in it. But now they have to think about what those cleaning schedules look like for the fall. So again, supply chains, are we going to have adequate um, soap and hand sanitizer and cleaning materials? Are our staff trained about how to do those kind of things? How are we going to do more and enhanced uh, cleaning throughout the day as we, we are encouraging them to, to do things? Uh, certainly, every, again, it's not going to look the same in every place, but how do you, how do you think about wiping down those doorknobs and, and doing things that, that are not normal? Now, many of these, I say not normal, but many of these practices have become more normal to us in the past few years because of the flu, um, flu outbreaks. Again, public health has been great about helping us think through mitigation of the flu. We had a half dozen school systems this year that had to close at some point because of influenza. And so we have gotten better about thinking about how we mitigate the spread of the flu, and many of those same practices are things that we'll have to put in place on a regular basis this school year. Oh yes, <clears throat> as I was uh, looking through your plan, one of the things that uh, sort of jumped out to me was the bus transportation mm -hmm. and how bus drivers are to just to report if they basically physically see any type of illness. With that being such a, a hot pocket of kids being right on top of each other, whether they're kids or teenagers, is there any major concern of outbreaks occurring because of the, the tightness of, of that type of transportation? Because it's, as you know, it's completely impossible to try to have social distancing on a bus with 40 kids and you're trying to keep that space between them. Sure. So I, I would have to say first, I don't think I have any greater concern about an outbreak related to the school bus than an outbreak um, in what we see, see going on, families getting together on weekends and all kinds of situations. As uh, Dr. Harris has made it clear, we've all got to be more conscious of our own behaviors to, um, to try to mitigate the spread of this disease. We've, we've got to be thinking about it, and I appreciate what he said. We can't think about, I'm going to social distance at one you know, one event, one time of the day, but then otherwise ignore it. Um, I'm just, I'm, we've got to be thinking more and more about that. So that being said, the school buses and transportation is an important part of uh, the academic world for about half of our students because they don't have another way to get to school. And so we have to make sure we transport students back and forth uh, to school. Uh, I would remind you we're one of the few countries in the world that transports students to school at public expense. But it has been one of the things that has made American public education stand apart from all those other countries, that we believe not only should we offer high quality education to every child, but we ought to be responsible for getting those children to and from school and responsible for making sure those children have nutritious meals every day. We're, we're one of very few countries, um, even industrialized Western countries, that have that philosophy that it's our responsibility not only to educate but also to transport and to feed and it takes a lot of responsibility to do that we are um, we're saying that the screening process has to begin at home so we need parents uh, and i won't go into all the details but it's in the documents in the guide we need parents to screen their children we need parents to check temperatures. We need parents to check for symptoms and cough and those kind of things and not put children on the bus and not bring children in their car and drop them off if they are experiencing new onset of symptoms that are um, unexplained. And then talk to their health care provider. Uh, just give a call to their health care provider or telemedicine about what they need to do next. We're not, we're not saying that everybody has to be tested, but they need to talk to their health care provider 
about what steps need to be take, taken next if a child's running a fever of more than 100.4, if a child has a sudden and unexplained onset of, of a cough and other symptoms. I, I'm going to get out of my lane because I, I don't know all the symptoms Dr. Harris does. So first set of screening starts at home. Uh, don't put the child on the bus if you know that they've got the symptoms and they're unexplained, not through undiagnosed something. Uh, then, as students get on the bus, uh, certainly, as you say, it's going to be hard to keep students apart on the bus, but we have asked them to continue to reinforce that we need students to take personal responsibility even on the school bus. So things they can do like sitting in their seat and facing forward rather than leaning across seats and, inter and interacting with other people. Um, the, m most every child touches the handrail when they come on the school bus. And so we've encouraged how do we make sure we've got wipes, we work, we do something to make sure we're continually keeping that handrail clean during the day. Um, there, there are things that we can do, and I won't go into more details, to make it safer. It's, it's never going to be the safest situation when people are together. It's a, the, the safest situation is for people to to never leave their homes, but we're going to go to school. We've got to get children to school, and we've got to do it in the safest way possible. We have uh, our last two questions here. Okay. Right, this question is for Superintendent Mackey or Dr. Harris. Do either of y'all have a sort of data set or official estimate for how many public school students are immunocompromised or have the kind of preconditions that would make catching COVID-19 especially dangerous? Um, I'll, well, I'll start that and then I'll pass to Dr. Harris. We, we don't have a specific number, no. Now, again, we know um, school by school, we do have some numbers. So we know because of students who qualify for special education, some of them, because of, what the, um, for, because of how they qualify, it automatically puts them in a more vulnerable population. But they would not be the only children. So, uh, for instance, as I understand it, and Dr. Harris, please correct me if I'm wrong, but a child who has a um, severe case of asthma would not qualify for special education necessarily. That, that would not make them qualify, but they may be a vulnerable population. And so, so we know some of those numbers, but we don't have an overall number of how many children would fit into all of those categories. And Dr. Harris may have more information he can add. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's actually an excellent answer. We don't specifically track that number. We have, uh, you know, population estimates of chronic diseases by age groups, but not something that we could, uh, you know, uh, assign specifically to whether they're a public school student or not. Um, Dr. Mackey's point, though, is an excellent one. There, there are conditions uh, like asthma, which uh, is overrepresented in our state, uh, which wouldn't necessarily be considered immunocompromising, but certainly would put people at risk uh, with this disease. Uh, um, and, and so there, there are uh, many things that we wouldn't traditionally count, I guess, in terms of immune compromising conditions that are still an issue. Dr. Mackey, uh, regarding traditional instruction, uh, we know that classroom size has been a discussion in public schools for some time now. Is there an opportunity in this pandemic kind of to reevaluate and look at the way um, our classroom sizes are? Uh, very good question. So we are going to look at those things across the state. Um, we have talked about, we've looked at several models, and obviously we've, we've talked to folks in multiple states. Uh, the idea, so we, again, we know what's the safest situation and we, we know we've got to get as safe as possible, but we're not going to be able to get to the situation where each child's isolated in their own room, obviously. So smaller classes do help. Uh, we'll have some natural attrition in that direction because if 20% of the students in a community say stay home, then you can spread to other children out more. We are not um, requiring by any means uh, some of the, the very best guidance that CDC put out. So you know that CDC put out um, the, the very best possible optional thing would be for each child to have a desk that was six foot from the next child and I think with a plexiglass um, room built around them. We understand that, that that's certainly safer, but that's not practical. 
So what things can we do? So what we're encouraging superintendents is doing inventory of all their classrooms and say, um, can these desks be separated further? You might, you might not be able to get six feet, but is there a way to rearrange the furniture in the room to separate it? Um, in many classrooms, y'all know I visit dozens of schools and hundreds of classrooms every year. I won't be this year, by the way. I'm not going to do that. But, uh, but you see a lot of uh, early childhood classes. Best practice educationally is to put those children in small groups. And so you'll see where the teachers have turned two desks face to face and two children are sitting there a foot apart, their heads a foot apart, um, and, and breathing on each other. Well, we've, we've encouraged them. Hey, even though that may be best practice for early childhood education, we're probably going to need to pull those desks apart, turn them so that each child's facing the same direction, so one child's facing the, the back of the next child, and the teacher is, um, is back to old-fashioned the way it was decades ago in the front of the room, keeping distance, personal distance from the children as much as possible. And there are other things that they can do. We've, we've got some, some really good ideas out there uh, from community to community, some classrooms will be really hard to do that because they don't have desks. They've, uh, because of the best educational practices, they've abandoned the use of desks and they have moon-shaped tables. And so they're trying to figure out if we don't have desks, how are we going to make that happen? So it, it is going to look different in every place, but we've asked them to look at the very best, most optimal thing possible and what you can do and see if you can find uh, the best compromise in the middle to keep students as safe as possible. And teachers and faculty too, by the way. Actually, one last one question. One last question. I apologize. You mentioned sure. surveying uh, parents not comfortable mm -hmm. coming back. Have we talked to our teachers, those particularly with health, con health conditions that don't want to return to school? So the question was, we, we surveyed parents. Yes, we surveyed parents. The question though is about teachers who might have a vulnerable condition, condition and don't return to school. Uh, they are talking to their local superintendents and principals. Yes, absolutely. Those are, those are considerations we have to make. Now, again, the department, we don't employ teachers. We support school districts, and then they employ and work with their teachers. And so we have been working with them. Some of the discussions earlier this week were about personnel policies um, and how to, to work with teachers um, on professional development, on their, um, if they're in a very vulnerable population, what can we do to, to help those teachers maintain safety? And sometimes it's not the teacher. Sometimes it's maybe the teacher has an 80-year-old uh, mother who has a serious condition living in her home, and so she's trying to make sure that she, she keeps um, special protocols for, to protect her family. So we're working through those, but obviously there's not a way to write a, a, a guide sheet for that. We've got to have, deal with those on an individual uh, basis one at a time. All right, we're drawing a line here, I promise. But this okay. question is for Dr. Harris or my yeah. name. I'm sorry, thank you. I mean, it's it's hard to ask journalists not to <laughs> ask questions. Uh, but so I'm just curious. I'm wondering if you could tell me, Dr. Harris, or if Mackie could respond. Is there what? Who is in charge of again closing down schools if we see another very large, very bad outbreak? Is that coming from you, Dr. Harris, or is that? going to be a combined effort? Do we, do we see that as being a distinct possibility in the future? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, school closures are certainly the prerogative of the governor. Um, there, there is statutory authority uh, for public health to do that, but, but clearly that's not a unilateral decision. That's a decision that would be taken in uh, cooperation with, with the Department of Education, with the governor's office, with a, a, a lot of other folks. So, uh, you know, the the statutory authority is certainly uh, one thing, but but clearly that's a process that we would uh, we All would right. have to consult with a lot of other folks before making a decision to do that. Okay, Dr. Sibley, are you going to say anything else? You want me to close this out? A couple of housekeeping. Okay. Get them out of the way. Thank you. More than anything else, thank you guys for being here. We appreciate your attention to this matter. It is, of course, very very important. Um, our document that is the, road, uh, the uh, roadmap to reopening schools will be available on our website, www.alsde.edu. I heard uh, that we were experiencing some technical difficulties with our website, so if it's down, keep trying. It'll be back up. It will be very prominent on the front of our website where you can go and download not only the more extensive document, but also a parent guide that is 
uh, shorter and a little easier to digest. So that is all that we have for today. Again, thank you guys for coming out. Have a wonderful weekend.